Hello and welcome to the Tefu Klamath Podcast. I'm Guillaume, your host, and each week, I'm fortunate to share with you stories from Klamath Tech founders, investors, and corporations sharing their unique insights into this fast-moving industry. Eventually, like me, you will learn, discover, and get inspired by those unique men and women who are contributing to the fight against climate change, and I hope it will help you to take a step in this formidable movement. So before we start, I just want to share a few words about us as this podcast is just the tip of the iceberg of what we do at Startup Basecamp to support the climate tech movement. Our mission is to accelerate capital deployment towards climate tech founders, allowing them to focus on scaling their solutions. How do we do that? Every day, we help founders access to resources and connections and gain the visibility they need to expand their growth. We do this in a number of ways with a membership platform, a Slack group, with a growing number of founders, investors, and experts from around the world. And recently, we went one step further with a matching services to connect founders with top climate tech investors. Keep in mind that we are able to do all of this thanks to the support of our listeners and our members. So please like and subscribe share one episode with a friend, join a community, and if you haven't already done so, make a small donation to support our work. It really means the world to us. And now, enjoy the show! Hi everyone, during this new episode of our Founder Series, we sat down with Marcus Lehmann, who has developed with his team a unique way to harness the power of waves. Waves are the largest unused renewable resource in the world with the great benefits of being more energy dense, stable and predictable than other forms of renewable energy. Marcus startup CalWave intends to equip coastal communities with clean, reliable and local energy while keeping our planet healthy. It was clear from speaking with Marcus that co-founding CalWave was a natural progression of what had been a continuous interest in both building things and riding the waves. From early on, Marcus was already building robotic boats and self-propelled surface vessels despite growing up in Munich, Germany. After studying mechanical engineering with a focus on entrepreneurship, Marcus came to UC Berkeley in California for his master thesis, where he was introduced to the technology that would lead him to co-found Galway. In the show, energy dependency is a particularly important discussion right now with the war raging in Ukraine, and it was fascinating to talk with Marcus about how this solution has potential to mitigate the energy dependency of so many coastal communities, particularly island nations. In doing so, we talked about the value chain of renewable energy, how that affects the adoption of renewables, and how CalWave is making waves in the energy market. The second part of the show, Marcus shares his tips for fundraising and getting out of your lab. He also gives some recommendations on work-life balance and books that helped him get there. Marcus, welcome to the show. Hi, Marcus. Welcome to the Tech for Climate podcast. I'm super happy to have you here with us today. I believe it's going to be a great opportunity to hear your story and learn more about your exciting journey with CalWave, which is on a mission to unlock the vast and steady carbon-free power from ocean waves at scale. So welcome to the show. Hi, yeah. Thanks for having me. Excited to be on. So early morning for you in California. Thank you so much for taking the time with us. So before we start, uh, if you could tell the, uh, the audience, uh, you know, give us a 30 second uh, introduction about CalWave. Yeah, CalWave is a technology developer to provide solutions that can harness ocean wave power. Ocean wave power is the largest unused renewable resource in the world, has great benefits being more energy dense and stable and predictable. And yeah, we don't really have a commercial solution yet. And so our um, team is developing um, yeah, a system, um, a power plant, similar to, let's say, an offshore wind turbine that can capture ocean waves to produce electricity in different power levels. Um, and yeah, it's been really exciting year for us um, the last <laughs> um, 2022. 
So let's start from the top before we, we dig into, uh, into CalWave uh, or we serve the, the wave, uh, if I can use that expression. Uh, let's start from the top. I, I'd like to understand a little bit more about like uh, you uh, as, a, as a person. I mean, what, what, what's your story and, and, and background? I mean, what are you passionate about and uh, what do you love to do besides uh, uh, building uh, CalWave? As I always ask, like, who is Marcus? Yeah, personally, I always like to build things. Interestingly, my family background didn't really have an engineering um, exposure. My my dad was a, a professor in IP, so I, I I knew learned about the value of intellectual property early on um, growing up with him, and um, certainly had a more of a e exposure to a, a traditional academic kind of household. But personally, I just always like to build things, be outside. Um, I, I was really fortunate to grow up with a, a nice big garden and just naturally gravitated towards um, building things. And um, yeah, then um, grew up sailing, um, grew up in Munich in Germany. And yeah, my dad took me sailing. So always had an exposure to water. And yeah, actually, even as a um, high schooler, a pre high schooler, um, started building some boat type, you know, self propelled autonomous surface vessels, if you want. So, very rudimentary, but I think now some of these um, we see actually going to the market. And yeah, also build a robotic ship. So, always yeah, had some exposure to um, yeah, building things. And then, um, yeah, for my high school final thesis, I had to um, yeah build. A, uh, oh, sorry, we had to write a final thesis, and you know there were just a bunch of options there and topics, and I really didn't want to do a very theoretical, you know, deep nuclear science kind of uh, topic. And there was just one topic that said, yeah, build and demonstrate something. And I just picked that without really knowing exactly what it is, and then it, it turned out to be a. A solar race car so there was a institute close to munich that was more of a training institute to help to develop workforce for you know the the solar industry that and very from the ground up that's from the installers to the actual project planners and designers um, of projects not so much the actual solar panels and so he just ran this student competition to raise awareness and yeah, that was my final thesis, build a, a solar race car that was fully powered by the sun and nothing else, no batteries allowed or anything. And so through that, I got exposure to the renewable energy industry pretty early on. That was in 2006. And then as part of that thesis, really learned about climate change, the IPCC, the, the state of the world, and somehow gravitated towards this because I saw that's the right thing to do going forward. And I, Interestingly, then later I enrolled into uh, mechanical engineering in Munich um, to keep myself broad. Can, you know, back then I debated between going into fusion versus uh, renewable engineering. I said, why not do mechanical engineering? Then I can help with both, depending on whether demand is going to be higher going forward. And interestingly, the the big lecture hall in uh, Munich in mechanical engineering is called uh, Rudolf, Rudolf Diesel Hall. And so personally, I, I grew up, I guess, yeah, a five minute drive from the, the private home of Diesel. And nowadays I find myself actually going around cleaning or trying to clean up what the diesel engine has created. You know, a lot of communities were hoping or in planning to help to become off diesel fuel. I always say it's now the, the duty of our generation to really clean up um, the you know, all the emissions caused by previous um, technologies that have been brought to market without understanding the global implications back then. Um, but I think there's also, you know, for future generations, there is a part of engineering ethics where you really want to think about what are the implications of the technology you're building and that there's a responsibility included into it. For us, the responsibility certainly is to make sure we're not affecting wildlife, marine life specifically, and we're extremely careful um, yeah, during our design period to make sure that um, it's it's been done in a safe manner. So th thank you for sharing uh, all of those uh, different uh, pieces of, uh, of of your life uh, prior launching uh, launching Calwaves. Uh, 
Would you maybe like uh, share with us like one or two uh, pieces of um, you know experience uh, during that whole journey in Germany uh, at in high school and then maybe maybe it was during also like your your time your childhood in you in your garden uh, I don't know but what are the one or two pieces of uh, experience that in a way uh, maybe is the move to, to California that gave you this edge uh, to to start uh, to start the company and be a, be an entrepreneur as well. That's a good question. Mm, I didn't really, you know, growing up in Munich, it's it's not Silicon Valley where you see that as a career path. And especially back then, it wasn't as uh, present as it's here in, in the Bay Area. And mm, yeah, my dad was a, a guest lecturer at UC Santa Clara. So I've been to San Francisco the first time when I was 11. And just personally really like the area here and mm, but growing up and then going to school i didn't even know the term entrepreneurship as i've seen um, here and there you know people you know that these are more like the forts 100 years ago started companies or you know bmw or siemens someone started that um, 100 years ago but they're not around the corner or that they're, they're not a role model you can relate to as a as a young student mm. But I think, yeah, I always had good ideas and was passionate about projects. You know, I had these construction projects with friends where we just build a, a skateboard ramp or these kind of things. And that always, you know, to the point where we sneaked out at night to finish our projects. So I just or we built like snow castles and the like. So I always loved these kind of team construction projects, naturally gravitated towards them. And then during my time in mechanical engineering, I had more and more exposure. Also, I did an exchange in Hong Kong at the business school there, just getting out a little bit and see the world. And they had a lot of entrepreneurship classes. And there was a, a venture capitalist from Silicon Valley that taught one class. And that was extremely impactful. He just let us read sections of books, of entrepreneurship books, and summarize them and share with the class. And that in, in the end of the semester, essentially the entire class essentially read a digest of 50 entrepreneurship books or so. And um, that was yeah extremely um, powerful that there are even companies now I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, some of these business books, you can summarize the, the core essence of the, the message in, into a couple sentences if you're doing it right. And so that's what he already um, did back then. And then yeah, um, participated in a couple of business plan competitions there and just started to learn more about entrepreneurship. And then I met a gentleman there also from Munich um, that did exchange at the same time. And then he told me about this program in Munich called, um, yeah, it was a you know, honors degree in technology management, kind of a startup MBA um, together between TU Munich and LMU, a pretty selective program. They would only take 20 people per year that have that kind of personal interest and drive and Mm, yeah, then I applied to that program and got accepted for the last two years of my master's. And that certainly gave me full on um, exposure to the startup world. You know, the curriculum was really designed to first do a, a market study. Back then, we wrote a trend report on um, home IoT, especially for elderly, um, and had actually some pretty good ideas that now I see being funded um, years later, um, yeah, similar kind of concepts um, for essentially allowing elderly to stay at home longer with the support of IoT and telemedicine. And then um, second part was to actually, um, it's called managing product development, really going through a product development cycle. So our team worked on um, e-mobility, so a smart solution to facilitate a floating car sharing fleet of electric mobility um, for urban um, areas. So that was pretty interesting. And then the last one, we actually consulted with the startup in Berlin. So that was a full on um, IT startup and, and we just helped them for a semester. And then through that program, 
um, because um, yeah, part of it was to yeah, go abroad and do exchange. Um, it's one of the four semesters. And a friend of mine got accepted to Berkeley and that was like one of the most popular destinations there. And I already ha had done my exchange with Hong Kong. But then I said, hey, I'll just join because um, I really enjoyed that experience, international kind of um, environment and then reached out to um, professors in, in engineering in, in Berkeley if I could write my master thesis with them because that was kind of the last step I needed for my other degree. And so that's really how it started. Um, and then this was really more of coincidence or faith if you want. So then I was just waiting um, for my visa to go on um, the trip to Berkeley about my master thesis. And I kept reading it's pretty interesting also during my college time, the, the two magazines I wrote, uh, was reading the most was MIT Technology Review and uh, the Business Journal, because um, we got that for free. And so I kind of saw both sides, uh, what's going on with the financial crisis back then in, in 2009 onwards, and um, also new technologies. And so while I was waiting for my visa to get started in Berkeley, I read about this new concept that a professor from MIT had about a, a submerged um, wave energy technology. And at the end of the article, I saw the name. It's like, oh, wow, that's the professor um, that just um, accepted my, um, my scholarship uh, proposal. And then in the beginning, he assigned me a more theoretical fluid dynamic kind of topic. But personally, I mean, my the focus in my master's was in systems engineering and energy systems. And so building a proof of concept um, for a new energy system was actually a better fit. And so kind of halfway through my six months uh, scholar, uh, visiting scholar um, appointment, yeah, I was able to convince him to let me work on the um, the the original concept that then led to the technology that CalWave is um, commercializing today. So before we, uh, we reveal too much about like the initial story that uh, you already started to, uh, to unveil, I'd like to take a, a zoom out and thank you so much for sharing uh, more about uh, your, your personal journey, uh, Marcus. I'd like to take the, the zoom out, um, as, I, as I mentioned, and we discussed that prior to the, the interview, uh, on the, the current uh, you know, energy crisis using the, the, the single of, um, angle of like renewable energy. Um, can you maybe you know share what um, some insights that uh, that you have uh, and maybe data points regarding the, the fundamentals of uh, of the current uh, energy crisis that we are uh, you know going through now in Europe and uh, uh, I know possibly that uh, the U.S. is also uh, partially affected to that. Um, I mean, what are the the, the fundamentals and, and the cause and the, the magnitude of it? And we can remind our audience in terms of like, you know, uh, how consequent like the, the fossil fuel, uh, you know, primary source of, of energy is still like, uh, you know, present uh, into, uh, in, into the system today. Yeah, I think a good starting point and, and without, you know, uh, engineering education, people often don't see these flow charts. It's, a, it's called Senki diagram that really shows the flow of energy. So how much raw energy is being brought into um, a country and then how much is being used for heating versus for electricity. And so if we look at these diagrams and every country has its own uh, flow chart there, but we also have a global flow chart. And so what we see there, this yeah, majority of our primary energy I want to say, yeah, above eighty percent globally is um, still from fossil fuels that are finite and essentially a major contributor to climate change. Next to the CO two emissions, um, just the entire production of uh, the entire value chain to get these from the resource to um, an end user uh, that ends up burning it. That also leads to high methane emissions that now are really um, well, have been identified as a significant contributor, a very potent um, greenhouse gas that we have to be careful with um, going forward. And so the interesting angle is that, you know, in, in, in thermodynamics, you always draw a system boundary and then you can describe what is going into the system, what is going out of the system, what's happening inside the system. And that kind of thinking is really helpful and what we're seeing is our solution specifically can help island and island communities. 
And so essentially, that's exactly what an island is. It's a <laughs> defined uh, small boundary, and they're very they can measure well what's going in, what's going out. And so some of these islands, what we're seeing, they are, you know, one of the most popular tourist destinations in the world, but essentially they're plus minus zero. Yeah, so for, for an island, the an entire amount of money, of um, yeah GDP they bring in from tourism, they then spend and goes out um, to imported fossil fuels. And if we look at, you know, nations by itself, they're no different than an island. They have their borders and you have resources flowing in and flowing out. You know, some of these, of course, have their own natural resources, but as I said, they're finite and they come with the environmental impact of mining them. And yeah, I think the COVID-19 crisis really has um, amplified how connected the entire global economy is, and that includes you know, shipping um, yeah, coal and, and fuels around. And now, of course, with the war in Ukraine and that, that entire crisis has amplified. But I think that's where people now realize that Europe as a, you know, economic region imports the majority of their primary energy. And so what renewables enable next to really the the lack of greenhouse gas emissions, um, if, if done right and built with sustainable power in the first place from an entire life cycle emissions perspective, it allows the community to become independent from imports, from um, energy, um, yeah, fossil imports. And so for Europe, there is a great opportunity just having a, a large ocean front there. Um, and I think the, that has been um, identified that this is yeah, a significant um, unused resource at the moment. And, and I think Europe is still um, leading in terms of percentage per um, capita in offshore wind. I think some other regions in Asia um, really take over at the moment in terms of total capacity of offshore wind. But we're seeing, you know, with the wind turbine being a very mature technology, now we can really start exploring um, the oceans, which are harder to access and, of course, more complicated to build than an onshore wind turbine. Um, but yeah, we're still really seeing these becoming one of the fastest growing industries. Um, yeah, in the renewable space in California, um, we just um, saw the auction of the offshore wind floating leases. So that's been pretty exciting. They yeah sold off uh, the Bureau of Ocean Management here, um, sold or leased off um, five areas for floating wind of about 100 million each was the auction. In um, New York, for example, they had um, yeah auction a couple years ago and you know, the total price paid for these auctions was in the multiple billions. That just shows how much value is in um, that pretty small, comparably small ocean patch. Um, and that's just with wind. And, you know, um, we're now really advocating to or um, raising awareness that there's more than just wind in there. There's also um, wave power going through the same lease area. And so we want to make sure that it's being utilized. Um, and in the long run, once the technology is, is ready for, you know, similar maturity than a wind turbine, it will just become a natural, um, yeah, a logical natural um, transition to utilize all renewables in that um, yeah, finite amount of ocean space that is, is very valuable to, to even get leased. So wait. Taking taking a zoom uh, zoom out and, and we'll go a little bit deeper into the into the, the ocean like opportunity uh, that the the waves and uh, actually like like the wind as you uh, you mentioned combined can can offer uh, in terms of the, the energy production. But um, when you when you look at it like what is like today in terms of like this and you mentioned that we are only close to around 20 percent of uh, the energy produced uh, coming from those uh, renewable energies uh, sources when you when you look at it like like today like what is according to you uh what is blocking the development of this of those energy um you know renewable energy uh at, at a larger scale uh, is it because in the past like uh, policies has been put in place that are blocking that or is it because the uh, the cheap uh, cost of uh, of fossil fuel i mean 
uh, and now we find ourselves in the in this corner uh, with uh, this energy crisis where uh, we we start to realize that the dependency that uh, that we have is too high and uh, and when everybody is friendly everything goes uh, goes well but then after that uh, we are uh, in in situation uh, as a, as a crisis like like today. So, what is your take there? Like, what is like blocking it, and what are maybe the mistakes that we did in the past that we should change for the for the future? Yeah, in general, and it's becoming a popular term is the energy transition. It's exactly from a transition from fossil based sources of generation to renewable, and others, or non fossil based and in general the util more speaking about large scale infrastructure you know and that's just a space that takes time to transition that's nothing you can just upload uh, download a, a, a software update or you know deinstall the one software and install the other one um, it takes time and capital to implement these changes and the next to these these big power plants no, as we've seen when Germany, for example, um, yeah, pulled out of the nuclear power plants, mm, the companies that operated these came with pretty large claims because they built and financed these, you know, similar to if you buy a house, you get a mortgage and then you finance that house and then you pay that house off over 30 years. These large nuclear power plants, you know, cost multiple billions and takes the most modern um, power plant um, for nuclear was built in Finland recently and I think it took 20 years or so from permitting to construction and then actually to go into operations and I, I forgot I think it went over in cost by a factor 10 or so so it took a long time and effort you know some people spent their careers 20 years is a long time to build these power plants and then they are financed for many years so they want to be paid off so that's nothing, you know, there's uh, there, there's some opportunity cost, but it's also very painful for the ones that build these to then just suddenly turn them off. And it's also, you know, in, in soccer with the World Cup going on at the moment, we always say never change a winning team. It's also painful to change a system that works, you know, it, it runs at the moment. And similar to, you know, in a couple of thousand years ago, when we discovered as a as a race the fire there was always one or two people that had to make sure the fire keeps burning um and keep, keeps it on and so on so i think it's similar to the utilities the you know we, we had a, a power outage here the other day just that experience we're so reliant on power in our um, modern society and the, you know there are uh, safety and, and health concerns for certain households that need medical or hospitals, you know, they're the most vulnerable and they have to keep their um, systems running. So there's really high stakes involved um, with power outages or the access to power. And that's why that's a very conservative industry that does not like to play around with things and just do trial and error. They really, I mean, they have a big responsibility in making sure um, the industry and the society has access to power and make sure that it never fails. And it's a different kind of, you know, in, in entrepreneurship, they're like the people that like to break things and, and um, try things to change, um, yeah, make these larger infrastructural changes um, over time. So question in terms of like regulation, uh, and we cover a little bit like the, the European side of it. Now you heard about like, I mean, in California, uh, the Green New Deal uh, and all of those uh, bills has been passed by the Biden administration. Do you see there that uh, we have like the concrete base to really like accelerate uh, the deployment at scale of those, um, you know, renewable uh, energy sources? Um, or we still see like there's maybe some, uh, uh, you know, um, missing opportunities uh, that uh, should be uh, you know put in place to really uh, accelerate the, this deployment and gain this uh, uh, you know um, energy independency that uh, we all need uh, to achieve uh, as soon as possible uh, coupled by the fact that we need to decarbonize those uh, the, those um, uh, the, the source of energy that uh, we are relying on yeah, California is certainly always on the forefront of innovation and sustainability. 
Mm, and as a state, they've set the, a mandate to transition to 100% uh, clean energy, I want to say by 45, 2045. Mm, so the clock is ticking and yeah, they're certainly with the big infrastructure um, support packages, the IRA here in the US, things are really starting to gain momentum and a yeah, big, unique part of this package is really the long-term ability to secure these um, yeah, support mechanisms. And, and as I said, you know, if you build these uh, renewable power plants, you want to be able to pay them off over many years. And that's the beauty of them, that they're reliable. Once you install them and, and operate them well, they just keep running. And so you want to be able to pay off um, and finance these. And, and so having this long-term prospectus in um, as part of your financing um, part of um, yeah, developing a project that really helps um, adoption and, and acceleration. So um, from what I've heard, that, yeah, solar is certainly a big winner um, in this infrastructure package. Now being able to finance projects um, very effectively with, you know, incentives that reduce or help to write off taxes on the capex, so the actual purchase of the equipment, but then also having um, production, um, PCTs, production and tax credits. And yeah, so that's um, overall the current, um, yeah, the current big package, but there were also other packages before and the state itself has um, yeah, support mechanisms. The California Energy Commission has a, a program that yeah, supports innovation in um, yeah, all, all parts of the energy landscape from, you know, managing the grid software to storage to new types of generation to EV adoption, you know, or using EVs as a virtual battery to feed power back into the grid and so on. So they're, they're really trying to attack it on all fronts wherever we use fossil at the moment. And it's, it's going to take some time. But um, overall, I think the, the general atmosphere is certainly positive that we're moving in the right direction. And it's, it's gaining momentum. My main concern is just that, you know, it's that kind of S curve where in the beginning you accelerate and you get a lot of momentum but then it's going to plateau and then it's going to take a really long time. Let's just take what we've seen with the percentage of renewables that, you know, getting us from, from zero to 5% is probably the easiest um, part and getting us from 95% renewables to hundred percent, is going to be the very hardest, that uh, long tail end. And then there's everything in between and we don't know exactly how hard is it going to be to go from 40 to 50, from 50 to 70% renewables and so on? What well, we know it's going to be harder and harder. And so um, with, you know, that being uh, energy and, and, and uh, this, these large systems being also quite political, main concern is that, you know, we, we might have a lot of optimism for the first 20, the first 50%. And then it's just going to plateau and very or stagnate. Um, so I think that's going to be important also for the next generations to make sure we keep up that momentum and keep pushing, even if things get harder and harder. So don't you think that um, and you heard the, the news recently about uh, this uh, positive uh, mass of energy that has been produced out of the, the fusion uh, nuclear uh, you know, system? Uh, do you think that um, speaking about these difficulties of reaching like the 99 or 95 percent of uh, uh, renewable energy uh, source within the uh, as a, a primary source of, of energy uh, solution like uh, fusion or uh, even like f uh, nuclear fission as we uh, as we know today uh, has an important role to uh, to play uh, and what's your what's your take on this uh, uh, fusion uh, excitement that uh, that we hear right now yeah, certainly very excited. As I said, I've been following the topic since high school um, closely. I went to school in, in Gaching, north of Munich. They, they, they had a, a model tokamak reactor out in front of the Max Planck Institute there. So every time I went lunch, I saw the magnetic coil um, <laughs> designed for fusion reactors. And mm, I think from a climate change perspective, we need everything. We're running out of time and we don't even have 
time or capacity to debate between this or that. Of course, there are finite resources, limited amount of funding and so on. But yeah, it's exciting to see that, you know, we're attacking it from all directions. Mm. The reality of a fusion or fission power plant, as I pointed out, is that these are big facilities and they will take time to get permitted and built and so on. And so difference between fission and fusion is, yeah, you don't have to pay for the fuel and you don't have to worry about um, the waste besides the radiated um, yeah, walls and so on of a um, fusion power plant. But fundamentally, it will... I don't see a big difference in the systems engineering side of things. You still have to build a power plant. You still have to turn that heat into steam, into electricity and distribute it on a, you know, a gigawatt level. And so, you know, it's, it's very exciting to see the progress there, but it's also not just because we've now, or let's say we find the solution, it's still going to take 10, 20 years to build all these power plants. And then also not every region will have the money and the ability to actually operate them. If you just go around the world and see who is actually able to afford and operate um, fission reactors at the moment. And then, you know, you can draw the analogy and say, yeah, fission is an is a old and somewhat mature technology um, for fusion being newer. It's probably going to be more expensive in the beginning and not everyone's going to be able to afford it. But it certainly it could help to produce, you know, huge excess electricity that then can be turned into hydrogen and so on. The other way around, you know, there are certain region I studied under the CTO of one of the leading hydro companies in the world. And there's some regions in um, yeah, not so friendly areas at the moment. They have huge um, historic dams for um, hydropower. planned strategy for infrastructure they build huge hydro dams in the middle of nowhere where no people live so technically yeah you could already go there and start produce hydrogen um, and you don't have to wait till your um, fusion reactor is, is up and running thank you so much for sharing all of those uh, very interesting uh, insights so now let's go deeper into uh, into cal wave i mean you already unfolded a little bit like the, the story behind it you're arriving at uh, at berkeley university meeting this uh, the professor and then starting halfway through your thesis uh, uh, collaborating on the on on the initial um, prototype perhaps i can uh, i can call it like that of uh, of cal wave so Maybe can you mention and remind us, like, I mean, which gap did you guys identify at first that initially led to the, the, the current version of, of CalWave? And in a way, why did CalWave uh, have to exist? Yeah, so from a technical perspective, the inception was really um, a geological phenomenon. It's in that sense, people have often heard of biomimicry where you know, inspired by a certain flight of bird has inspired Da Vinci to develop the first kind of airplane concepts. In our case, it was really um, geomimicry um, where people observed a certain mud region that is very effective in extracting wave energy. So it's really a, a, um, yeah, a membrane that has a certain physical property that just acts as a shock absorber and just absorbs waves very effectively. And so Professor Alam from from Tef Lab, UC Berkeley, um, yeah, investigated exactly that, or tried to describe it mathematically for his PhD. And the spring damper model, or let's say a power plant, a renewable power plant is, is exactly the same as a spring damper model where the damper is your, your generator. And so just discretizing that um, principle to spring damper model then became evident, yeah, you could start using that configuration to produce power. And so then that was from a systems engineering perspective, a really interesting challenge to take a mathematical concept and actually turn that into 3D and a physical product that meets all the demands of the entire life cycle from, you know, being fabricated to transport it, to installed, to maintained, to connect it to the grid, to then decommissioned at the end of the life cycle. So that's that makes it, you know, from a engineering perspective, um, 
the mathematical model had one single objective is produce as much power as possible versus from a product perspective, you have a chain of requirements that are sometimes conflicting. So it becomes significantly more complex to find a package between all of these. And it's a very, very interesting challenge, but uh, certainly not straightforward. And so our team really yeah, has taken all this into account and also iterated based on the initial concept. So we've we've made some uh, yeah some very important learnings and improvements to the initial concept that now um, arrives at a product that is really um, ready to be deployed commercially comparable to let's say an offshore wind farm. So I think it's a great opportunity for you to uh, kind of like walk us through the, the, the process. I mean, how, how does it work? I mean, what are the different uh, components necessary? I mean, how much energy are you able to, to produce with uh, uh, each unit that you already have in place today as a, you know, a, and a which scale or uh, how far can you go in terms of like uh, production uh, in itself uh, as per unit in terms of energy production, I mean. Um, Tell us a bit more, like, you know, how long does it take to, to put, or to manufacture or to build one of those units uh, as of today? I mean, if you can help us to, uh, and the audience to visualize, um, you know, the, the, the whole product and how the, the magic works. I mean, what, what's, your, uh, what's your secret sauce there? Yeah, so our technology we arrived at is um, <clears throat> a submerged pressure differential system. That means we are operating underwater at all times and there are a lot of side benefits to it, but the primary drivers for us to operate submerged was really to arrive at the lowest cost of energy. And to get there, there are really two main drivers. One is you have to, um, yeah, you need as high efficiency performance as possible, turning as much wave power into electricity as possible. The second part of the equation, e equally important, is how expensive is it? So keep your costs low to actually buy and fabricate the unit, but then also to maintain it. Um, so, and they can, you know, you can build a perfect, in space, they have very um, hard time maintaining things and sending people. So they build very expensive systems that last and, and don't fail. The other way around, you can build extremely cheap systems that need a lot of maintenance like your you know cheap headphones you might just replace them every half a year and so on and so for, you know you can balance between capex and opex and that's exactly an optimization um, challenge um, going forward that yeah you want to the the sum of both of these over the lifetime of a power plant 20 30 years you want to arrive at the lowest possible expense um, capex plus opex together and so we've been optimizing for both of these from the very beginning. So I think that's really unique about our generation of um, yeah, developers now um, developing uh, wave power is that one, we're really taking that entire life cycle from a systems engineering perspective um, right from the beginning, not just at the very end once everything is ready and then you start to think about cost, but right on the on the white paper level, we've iterated um, to arrive at the lowest possible cost. And at the same time, we have tools now available that even five, 10 years ago, no one really had at their disposal or only very, you know, for offshore oil and gas, these are billion dollar revenue projects and platforms that gives you the respective um, development budget um, and the engineering tools. But with open source and the, the yeah, uh, decreasing cost of computation, we were able to run pretty advanced um, fluid simulations, optimization, even on the, the Berkeley Lab supercomputer during our time at Cycleton Road. Um, so that's been really exciting now that, that we can integrate and leverage all these advanced simulation tools now. And then of course, cost of sensors also have decreased. So just from high volume production of smartphones the the cost of motion sensors for example has gone down significantly and that we actually benefit from from all these um, complementary advancements um, as often and you know for technological breakthroughs it's pretty interesting if you go back and say hey why was the first airplane really produced in in a large volume in you know, the, the 19th century, why not the 18th century? We had everything or what was missing. And often it's several things coming together that, you know, 
just being able to fabricate steel in a certain way or um, it's it's quite interesting if you um, check it back and see hey why was this not introduced a century earlier and then see what things had to come together then to make it happen um, that's yeah just a personal um, hobby of mine to um, go back and and um, question these things um, so in terms of uh, of capacities like i mean how much energy each unit is able to uh, to produce uh, the one that you have uh, tested uh, for for many months now uh, outside of uh, on the coast of uh, san diego i believe um how much energy have you, have you been able to to produce and what's the the next version of that the next iteration of it and maybe tell us what you what did you learn during that uh, uh, real life uh, you know uh, submerged at sea uh, uh, test and, uh, and 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 experience in itself yeah, so how if we're planning to offer two initial product lines to the market a 100 kilowatt and a 800 kilowatt um, unit and um yeah, they are scalable like a wind turbine. So, you know, once the the most optimum architecture of a wind turbine was um, yeah, developed, then now we saw bigger and bigger turbines. So even for offshore wind, the first offshore wind farms in, um, yeah, in Scandinavia, they were um, actually built with 800 kilowatt wind turbines. And now we're seeing 15 megawatt turbines being um, offered to the market. And so, but fundamentally, they stayed the same turbines, three blades, uh, horizontal, um, upwind. And so similar, our technology is also scalable. And with the pilot in San Diego, the, the Department of Energy um, yeah, f f supported, um, funded this project. And in that funding call, we won in 2017, there were certain constraints to it, um, one that, you know, because of the budget constraints of this initial contract, they they set a certain limit to a certain size. So what we've built um, for San Diego was a scaled version of our 800 kilowatt kind of megawatt class system. And yeah, the objectives were really to go through all the, um, as, as pointed out, all the elements of um, a field trial that leads to then project financing and de-risking. Um, so just going through, um, the list here, of course, performance, but then also installation, um, yeah, maintenance, um, our protocols, um, the autonomy, so our um, controller that operated the system autonomously. Um, yeah, initially, the goal was to operate for six months, and then we had um, really high reliability, um, no intervention for that initial six months period. So we extended um, to 10 months. So that was um, really exciting for the team as well. Um, a slight surprise, we had planned, budgeted uh, at least two interventions to you know recover the system, fix something, redeploy it, um, first time being in, uh, in a hard, hard to access environment. But yeah, that was really not needed. And then we extended to 10 months and with that, um, we're able um, yeah, to collect more data. We, technically, we could have operated longer, but more for project management specific reasons. We yeah, then had to um, stop operating after 10 months and recover it. Um, but overall, that was extremely exciting. And I think it's also a result of um, one, the quality of tools we've built that, you know, our drivetrain, we tested in a laboratory controlled environment pretty close to the actual real world conditions. And so that ability, you know, in the ocean, you don't want to do trial and error, just put out things uh, and see until it breaks and then go and fix it. It's more like you do the engineering right and then it works a little bit like, you know, space where still, you know, some of the earlier rockets still didn't, didn't make it as intended. But in the best case, your engineering and your modeling in advance is good enough or is sufficient to, to then not having to um, yeah, recover or fix things in the field. And so for us, the trial was really more of a validation of the quality of the tools, simulation and forecast models we've developed, as well as that um, controlled dry testing of the, the bench. Um, so that's been extremely exciting. And now we're upscaling the system to a 100 kilowatt unit and planning to deploy that in Pakwaif in Oregon. So that's a new 20 megawatt grid connected test site, um, also funded by the, the Department of Energy. 
So how do you select uh, the, the area that are suitable to, uh, to install uh, you know, those uh, different uh, modules and, and units? I mean, what is required to, to make it like uh, work and, and, and feasible? I mean, and how many units uh, do you plan in the future to be able to uh, you know, install all together at the same, uh, same site? Yeah, so there are different parts or different life stages of a technology. One is really to demonstrate it and get it um, certified um, with a new technology. And then where do you actually install them, operate them for 20 years? So Packwave is certainly a, a demonstration site that is suitable for all kinds of technologies. Um, NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, they have a wind test area in Boulder, for example, where they just test the and turbines and usually for these you actually want a location that has more on the extreme side of conditions because with that you can really de-risk the technology you know you know 50 or the, the largest storm in 50 years is, is pretty large there um, compared to you know um, other locations in the world so it's a really good proving ground for the technology um, for commercial rollout we can be at areas where, for example, an offshore wind farm could not go. Mm. Our system operates fully submerged. That means we can be much closer to shore. Offshore wind often gets um, pushed back uh, because of the visual impact mm, it causes. And so yeah, being able to uh, be submerged, we can be much closer to the end user um, on the coastlines. At the same time, we can still co-locate with an offshore wind farm. In the long run, you know, once, let's say, the megawatt class units are ready for serious production, then, um, yeah, we can design wind and wave farms from scratch together in the optimum, you know, economic optimum. In the beginning of the industry, I see the the benefits more to co-locate them in a different uh, same area, but in their own designated regions, but share the same electrical export infrastructure. And that's where wave power actually has a big advantage because we're using water and not air. So we only take about 10% of the same land to arrive at the same, let's say, 100 megawatts um, farm density compared to an uh, offshore wind farm. So there is some benefits, especially in, in space where uh, you have space constraints. And as we've seen now in these auctions that the space is not coming for free um, although it's it appears to be unused oceanfront um, for, uh, yeah, from the outside but uh, this actually is still pretty valuable um, as we've seen now um, so yeah that's the the big benefits and yeah I missed to answer your question on the production volume or a system you know I worked at a car factory um, before um, and we produce the vehicle every 64 seconds or so so it just depends on you and this is one factory so there's one uh, model car for example you see all around the world and it comes out of one single factory it's sometimes it's actually impressive that you know to japan and saw the car there and it's like oh i know exactly the factory where this car was being produced and so that's the power of you know industrial manufacturing for wind turbines, especially the larger ones, they are not being produced like a car in a, in a fully robotic factory. Although a lot of robotic technology is being used for welding and so on, it's more serious in volume production. Um, but to, you know, to answer your question, I don't see any difference between our system and a wind turbine. Um, so yeah, we can be produced in the same volume as a wind turbine. Similar technology, actually, the, the same components that go into a wind turbine, similar fabrication, um, logistics, transportation needed. Potentially our system might even be easier to transport because it floats, it's like a ship. Um, so, you know, people build um, yeah, ships in series uh, as well. So at the right location, um, things can come together. So our vision is really to manufacture the whole in, in series, uh, similar to a, a ship, um, kind of a standardized ship production. And then we bring in the motor of the ship, um, but more, it's in our case, more a generator. And we bring that in as um, a already pre-assembled package. And then they, they both are brought together, um, similar to, you know, the, the ship manufacturers, they're not assembling their, their engines themselves. They buy them from an engine manufacturer. So that's really how we see um, the, the commercial rollout in large volume than in the coming years. 
So maybe that's a, a good uh, good moment to kind of like try to understand a little bit like what is the, the business model that uh, you guys want to uh, to put in place? Are we are you going more to a licensing model or a production heavy uh, collaborating with like shipyard and uh, in manufacturer? And and what are the maybe if you can touch you know share with us a little bit like what is the uh, economics uh, that uh, or the future economics that you see for uh, Calwave? Yeah, it's a good question on the business model. As of now, we're planning to become an equipment provider and after sales service provider, so no different than um, a wind turbine OEM, original equipment manufacturer. And um, yeah, we might, it, then it's always an economic question with make or buy that will come down to volume that in the beginning, at a lower volume, you might still contract things out with an EPC. And then as you um, increase the volume, while still, of course, making sure the quality, especially for offshore, quality and reliability will be our core, um, you know, differentiator. And that's something we want to keep close to our chest to make sure it meets the, the quality um, standards we need to um, ensure the reliability. And then, um, yeah, the essentially payback is um, secured at all times in terms of economics. Um, that, that was part of um, yeah, my work at Cycloton Road at Activate is really to investigate path to cost reduction. And so what we're seeing fundamentally in wind and solar that the costs go down exponential. Um, you always see these straight lines on a logarithmic chart, so <laughs> exponential cost declines. And they're driven by two factors, economies of scale in wind, meaning building bigger wind turbines. If you, you know, the labor to install a one megawatt wind turbine versus a three megawatt wind turbine is pretty close to it's the same but you get three times the power um, out of a larger turbine so that's one and then often people mix up economies of scale and economies of mass production that's then um, mass production second factor it's really the rights law of using industrialization you know that's why um, cars are so cheap now because we um, you know divided the steps and and we produced them in factories and and introduced um, automation as part of the production process so these are two phenomena in the next to that for renewable energy projects the bigger the projects, the cheaper the cost, because you're amortizing, you're distributing the cost of some of the upfront engineering over a larger farm. And so it really depends on, you know, what size of unit, what production volume, what size of farm are we building? But what we're seeing is that, yeah, with about um, 500 megawatt accumulated production, we expect to be then cost competitive with offshore wind um, power purchase agreements um, that we're seeing at the moment. So a couple of more questions um, before we, we, we close this, uh, this first part of the interview. Uh, I'd like to understand a little bit like then in terms of like production, like uh, you guys are going to produce them uh, yourself. Like do you, I mean, what are the challenges behind that, uh, that production, that logistic uh, chain that, uh, that you see and how do you, uh, uh, defend, uh, you know, yourself, are you, uh, how defensible is, uh, is the, the, the CalWave, uh, you know, I would say hardware and uh, in, in, in R&D and technology behind that? Yeah, maybe I start with the second half of the questions. We're actually a software company, so our core IP is these high quality um, model simulation tools, as well as the controls we've developed. That's also our trade secret next to the patents we have on the actual architecture. So in that sense, we're um, yeah, well defensible. It's also the time it takes to you know, actually um, arrive at hardware. It's always, it looks harder than software from the outside, but because of the time it takes to figure out all these things and, and the lead times of parts and so on, you also have the same time as you know the, as defense so um, um, certainly the, the the more the further you are the more defensible it becomes and um, yeah as I said the controls and the software is really a key aspect and then going forward of course our understanding of you know the big data if you have many machines in the field you see patterns for offshore predictive maintenance remote inspection will be extremely important topics and that's what we're seeing in the wind industry that 
and the banks that finance wind farms, they want to make sure the OEM that has built the wind turbine also services them because they see, you know, the patterns of failure and often lead to the lowest cost of maintenance then if if the maintenance is done by the same company that built the turbines and has data on all their machines in the field. Mm. And uh, remind me, what was the first part of your question? <laughs> in terms of uh, in terms of production, like what are the you know the the, the challenges that uh, you see to put in place the, the initial like production line and how long would it take? Like what are the next steps in in, in that sense? Yeah, it's certainly commercial risk. You know, we've uh, the the main focus for us the last couple of years was on technical risk, removing. Um, getting the technology to a bankable state and then now going forward the focus um, will shift more towards um, yeah, removing commercial risk manufacturing and, and producing these kind of systems it's something that has been done before uh, everywhere in the world as said most likely anyone that can build a wind turbine will be able with, with our guidance to build um, our x-wave um, technology and so Mm, yeah, it, it will really come down to um, optimizing for cost and logistics where, you know, um, are we manufacturing the whole, the bigger pieces close to the actual deployment side, uh, customer side. Mm, what we're seeing in offshore wind in the US now, that a lot of companies that bring in the expertise in, from offshore wind, uh, originally from Europe, they now start to build factories in um, in the US on the East Coast. So in terms of challenges, we, we actually see that more as an opportunity for workforce development and job creation. Um, and I think the same jobs that currently now build the, the offshore wind turbines in the East and West Coast, they will be able to also fabricate and then install, operate the same firms that that install um, or finance a wind park and, and operate them, they will be able to transfer their expertise and operate the wave park. Um, so overall, we're extremely excited and, and see that uh, more as an opportunity as well for um, yeah, the communities to create new jobs. So how can the, the listeners of uh, the show, uh, experts, investors, uh, uh, entrepreneurs can, uh, can help you and what's next for, uh, for CalWave? Yeah, we're always looking for talent. At the moment, we're looking for senior electrical engineer, someone that has had his hands on higher power systems and um, yeah, also a couple of other open positions planning to grow more. So um, yeah, please um, subscribe on cowwave.energy um, also for future opportunities. And then from a investor and partnership um, side, yeah, we're always keen on um, yeah, starting the conversation um, about partnerships there um, as we kind of now advance towards commercial rollout and yeah would love to get in touch with anyone interested at the same time being a small team we're always keen on um, yeah, advancing our advisory board we're extremely grateful for the advisors that has have been helping us um, along the way and um, also planning to grow that and complement that exactly in the areas where um, yeah, we have challenges ahead. Um, it's really important to find the right experts that have done that before and I'm really keen on yeah, starting the conversations there as well. So last question on, on my side, like what's your personal on, opinion on the, on the climate crisis? I mean, as I always ask, like, are we doomed? What would you say to people who are, you know, feeling demoralized by all of the visible consequences that uh, we have today? Yeah, I think if you certainly zoom out and look at the big picture, it looks daunting. Personally, growing up in the Alps, I had that experience arriving at a pretty challenging climb for the first time myself. And then I just looked at this and say, what, we have to go up there all the way. And, you know, it looks super scary. And then I had like a racing heart, completely overwhelmed. And then you just start going and you go one step at a time. And at the end, then it's actually not that scary if you're just focusing on the next step and making sure you're secured and you don't fall. And so I think yeah, arriving at the big picture and it's good that people wake up and arrive at the big picture. But now it's more mm, getting to work and picking up where the, the most impactful first steps are and, and then all together going one step at a time as quickly as we can. So certainly 
you know, what's a little scary is the accelerating um, nature of climate change that we haven't really fully grasped yet and no one can tell. I mean, what I can tell you being in the ocean space is that we're extremely lucky with the, without the ocean, we would certainly be doomed because uh, the ocean acts as a huge heat sink as a big thermal battery. Water is a really good way of storing energy as, as you have in your basement. And so I think what we don't have fully understood yet is by heating the ocean, what the long-term effects were and, and how much time the ocean essentially saved us um, by being a big heat sink but that will arrive on shore soon as we're seeing with the amplified extreme um, weather events everywhere and so yeah i think mm, we should not waste any more time um, and debates on irrelevant things and that's kind of what personally makes me upset at times it's like even if we're not exactly sure but just the case that it could you, you know you're essentially gambling on the existence of our biodiversity. It's like, yeah, it might not be that bad or it might actually be really bad. But just because there is a chance it might end up being really bad, that itself, like, you know, we're playing it pretty risky in the sense by saying, oh yeah, we're just hoping it's not gonna be that bad. Um, and yeah, I think from a insurance perspective, and that's why it's interesting, the people that actually run mathematical models on these are the reinsurances. So the insurances, the insure insurances. And so they've, you know, there's Munich Re, for example, where I, um, I went to school and just walked by their office any other day. And they've seen in their model that it's not looking good. And that's why themselves, they started to invest in, in climate solutions. Um, so, you know, that being an emotional topic, I think it's a good time to rely on the people that actually run mathematical and statistical models um, and, and guide our decisions um, with, with their help. Any question that I should have asked that I didn't for this first part of the interview? I think, yeah, we, no, that was a pretty um, wholesome conversation. I think we covered. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marcus, for uh, your time, your incredible insights, all the hard work that you uh, that you do to uh, to build this uh, better and cleaner world uh, with a uh, cleaner energy, uh, uh, unleashing the, the power of waves. So uh, thank you so much for uh, all of uh, what you're doing uh, for everybody. No, thanks for the <laughs> exciting conversation. Really enjoyed. Uh, thanks so again for joining us on the Tech for Climate podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. Stay tuned next week for more Climate Tech Insights. In the meantime, head on over to our webpage at startupbasecamp.org where we have lots more insights and resources for anyone wanting to get involved in climate tech. If you find our resources useful, please consider donating to support our small self-funded team. Don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. And see you next time.